He's not here. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I know he's around. Sorry? I know he's coming back and he'll be here at some point in the service. But you guys know where he's been? You know where your, your, your pastor has been? He's been in America. That's where he's been. So he came back the other day and he called me and I could barely tell who he was. Like, hi, hi. I was like, hey, that one has no R. You know. Hi, how are you doing? So I just asked him about how. Hey, please, 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 please. He's not here. He's in Dubai. He's not here. So I can talk about that. All right. Good. So, you know, so I asked him about how his trip in America has been, what it's been like. And he told me just one thing. He told me, yeah, yar, yar. Yar. He does not R's, but I mean, you know. Can I just hit before you finish? Can I hit on someone? I had a friend who went to Daystar and came back with an accent. My track was Yar. So anyway, so I called for some time and asked him, how's America? Yar. And he told me, Yar. The one thing you tell me is, yeah, the war is better there. The war is. The war is much better there. So please don't tell me my hit on him. But uh, good to see you guys. Uh, good to be back here. I'm going to talk. We finished our series. We made a one off. Today, but uh, good to see you guys here today. I want to start and ask you a question as we kind of get going this morning. I want to ask you, what's one thing that makes you impatient? Or what's one space that you enter and you're just like, you just get so impatient? Can you think of a place where you get impatient? Yes. I want to tell someone next to you. Just one place. Tell someone, I get so impatient here. Just one place where you get completely impatient. One place you get completely. Can I hear? Where, where is the place you get impatient? Just shout it out. At the bank. At the bank. Forming, yes. It's like I'm growing old in traffic. Traffic, you can become completely. This week, by the way, in traffic, I, I you know, I was driving somewhere in, in the Dutchman area and uh, I saw a, a, a shortcut. I saw a shortcut just open. So I was like, what? I was like, I was stuck in traffic and I was like, how come you're not using this shortcut? How come? I discovered when I went that way, why you not using this shortcut? Like 10 minutes later, there was a big ditch and what, 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 and I was like, what? Uh, anyway, I was, anyone ever gets impatient at, say, the supermarket? Yes. Ever get impatient there? Do you ever find yourself, you've gone to the supermarket, you've filled your trolley with stuff and you're now approaching the counter and you're doing that thing, you're looking for what? The one with the least guys, you're like, where is the one with the, where is the one with the least guys? And then you see, and then you know, this always happens. You see the one you want to go to. And you see someone walking towards it. Whatever happened to you? And you, you know, you know, you do it gracefully because you guys are swag. You guys are swag. You just do it gracefully, but you just like beat you. That's, that's one place I find people get very impatient. And then supermarkets are crazy because supermarkets, you go and then there's that one counter that's for how many items? Five items or less. And the guy in front of you doesn't understand that. For him, he thinks it's five types of items. <laughs> so he has type, his first type is so. He's got here is Omo, here is Ving, here is Lux, here is G, and then his second type is Foodstuffs. You're like, oh God, Jesus, take the wheel. That's one place I find people get very impatient. ATMs, ATM queues. Do you get impatient at ATM queues? Now, I, I fortunately bank with a very small bank, and I'm quite grateful for that because. Whenever I go to my ATM and I find one person there, I'm like, you guys, you guys, for me, you came today. <laughs> now, this is the time you've chosen to come to the ATM, right now. Like what? Some of you don't understand because you bank with some of the bigger banks, and end one a time like this, there's a queue, it's like it's bog off. You withdraw one shilling and one shilling free, half the country is up. Everyone shopping. Anyone ever get impatient shopping? Anybody ever get impatient shopping with someone else? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, let me just say that my wife is I love I, I love I love taking shopping. No, 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 I'm just telling you. I mean, it just it just warms my heart. It feels like rainbows and bunnies and butterflies. Whoa, it's, it's wonderful. You know, you know it's true. You know, it's absolutely true. But people get impatient in all sorts of places.
basis. Well, you know, the thing is this, is that regardless of where you are on that kind of like patience continuum, none of us likes being kept waiting. Is that true? None of us likes keep, uh, being kept waiting, whatever it is. But in the place I realize I really had a head. Hey, microphone. Hey, excuse me, it's America, it's America. Yeah. The only place I really hate being kept waiting is with God. I'm just like, I really hate when he keeps me waiting. I feel, do you ever feel sometimes like you're waiting on God for something and you feel like, like your, your, your letter got lost, got lost in the mail somewhere in heaven, like the angel was holding down there, like, where's Peter's letter? Forget about that, I got lost. Maybe you're looking for, I don't know, maybe you're looking for a job. Okay, you've been looking for a job for a long time, wondering, hey, when is this thing ever going to happen? Last month we talked about relationships. Maybe you want to get into a relationship, or you want to get married, and you're wondering, hey, when is this thing ever going to happen? Uh, you know, it could be one of many different situations. Maybe you're a family here looking forward to having kids, and the kids haven't come, and you've waited, and you've waited, and you're like, hey, what's going on in this situation? Maybe it's a different thing. Maybe you're waiting for a breakthrough in your life. Maybe you're waiting for that one deal with your business or with your hustle, that one deal that will sort out your finances. But it's never come. Maybe you're waiting on someone in your family to get healed of a situation or something going on, and it's just taken so long for that to come around. Maybe you're waiting for a breakthrough, one type of breakthrough or the other, and you're like, hey, God, what about me? What's happening? Why am I waiting for so long? Well, I tell you what, if you've ever been in any of those spaces, Today's a good day. Tell someone next week, today's a good day. Today is a good day. We're going to have a good place. Because today we're going to take a look at a passage of scripture and learn something from some people who waited. But they got tired of waiting. And I'm hoping we can learn some things from their own experience that can inform us, especially when we get tired of waiting on God. We're going to read from the book of Exodus, chapter 32. Now, before we read, I want to give a little bit of background, a little bit of context to what's happening by the time we get to the book of Exodus chapter two, chapter 32. Now the people of Israel, God's chosen people, the Israelites, the Israelites, you know, from the historical people of Israel, they have been, you know, in, living in Egypt for many years, they have eventually fallen into captivity and working as slaves there. But by God's mighty hand, they leave, you know, through the story of Moses, and these people, you know, they, they of the book is about the Exodus out of Egypt into their promised land. And they go and they go and they cross the Red Sea, and the thing is, God has actually promised them, if you read, I think it's uh, a, little bit, a little bit earlier, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 8, a better future. He promised them a fertile and spacious land, one that's flowing with milk and honey. Now, historians will tell you, before you get to the passage of scripture, historians will tell you that their journey for the Exodus should have taken them about two weeks. Maybe a little bit under, maybe slightly under two weeks from the point where they were, you know, in Egypt, the point where they were supposed to get to their promised land. But by the time we come to Exodus 32, it's been more than two weeks. It's been about two months. So it's been two months and they're taking this very circuitous kind of brown route to where they're going and they're still a long way off. This two-week journey has become a two-month journey. And then, they're not even moving by the time we get to Exodus 32. They've actually stopped. They've actually stopped and set up camp at the bottom of a mountain, Mount Sinai, uh, or Mount Sinai, depending. And, and they've actually stopped at this point. Now, what has happened is that uh, Moses and his sidekick Joshua have gone up into the mountain to speak with God. Let's see what happens, because we pick up the story. We actually need to be... Mm. <laughs> I'll be biting your tongue in your beauty, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that is too big for the mouth, man. Right? I don't know. So we're going to read from Exodus 32, but before that, we'll read a couple of verses in Exodus chapter 24. Just a couple of verses there, but then our main text is actually from Exodus chapter uh, 32. So let's turn to Exodus 24. We're going to read verses 12 to 15. And I actually ask, you have that on the screen? You might actually just read that off the screen if you have it. All right, let's, let's, take, let's take a look at it together. Exodus 12, 24, from verses 12 to 15. So the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commands I have written for their instruction. Then Moses set up with Joshua his name, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and her are with you. 
and anyone involved in this dispute can go to them. Verse 15, when Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it. So in this part of the scripture, what we're seeing, Moses and uh, Moses and Joshua going up the mountain. Who do they leave in charge? Aaron and? Aaron and? Ur. Ur. Is anybody pronounce that? How is it pronounced? Ur. Ur. Uh, Ur. Alright. Alright. Right. Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 22. This is our main text. Exodus chapter 22. We're going to read verses 1 through to 8. It says this. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with the tool. Then they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of a calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Verse 7, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick, they have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Let's take a moment and just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you because your word, when we interact with very briefly, it can, it can completely change our lives. Father, we invite you into this space today. I pray the Lord today will not just be an exercise in spirituality, but the Lord will enable each one of us to connect with you. Because Lord, I, I realize what a word for every single person in this place today. Open up our hearts, Lord, that we would hear from you. I pray the Lord just like John, I would decrease. This must be nothing about me and everything about you and what is it you want to accomplish in Mavuna downtown today. In Jesus' name we pray that everybody then said, Amen. Amen. So here's a recap of what's just happened. Moses has gone up the mountain. He's gone up with uh, Joshua. And while he's been away, a not-so-quiet rebellion has happened uh, against Moses and against God. These guys, at some point, they're like, hey, us guys, we, you know, we don't know what's going on right now. And they rebel and they move on. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but the question begs to be asked. What happened to these guys? Why is it that they, you know, they had such a stunning turnaround in such a short period of time. It's so funny because if you read a little bit earlier, uh, in Exodus chapter 24 and verse 3, Moses has gone up the mountain, he's come, he's kind of had a conversation with them. This is what they say. They say, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. I can see them that convincing themselves and convincing Moses, Akianani, Akianani, we whatever you say, we are going to do. This is Exodus chapter 24. Eight verses later, these guys have turned around. What's going on? Why has their faith collapsed so spectacularly, so quickly? Because I read the text, I think I found a clue. Now, I don't know if you guys are going to spot this clue. Let's see if you can spot what the clue is. It's actually in the text in verse 1, it says this. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from, whoa, wait. Anybody see the clue? All right, let's try it again for those who have it. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming, what's the clue? How long was Moses gone? So long. Moses was gone so long. He was gone so long. So long. Moses was gone. So okay, I'm pushing it. <laughs> but now who are they supposed to turn to? Because Moses has been gone so long. <laughs> And they're, they're cool people, they're cool people. What are they all good people? But what Moses? You are Moses. You are the Moses. The Moses. You're the one who talks to a burning bush. And the thing talks back to you. I haven't seen Aaron done that. Do that. I haven't seen Aaron do that. 
tough day, tough day at the office. <laughs> and I'm like, you know Moses, you're the one who goes to the one. <laughs> Like, what do I say? 
So when you go and you do this mind numbing work, you do like eight to ten hours of this really terrible radio shift thing. And what I found very interesting about it is how time got back when I was there. Because you're dying to get out. So when you're working, you're there, you're like the chicken of thing, take the chicken, put them on the home, take the chicken, put them on the home. Ten hours, put them on the home. <laughs> like, and then you tell yourself, don't look at the clock, don't look at the clock, not look. Look, when you do this, okay, and look every five minutes. Right? And the funny thing is, you look every five minutes, and one minute has passed. That's how it was. You're like, no! But then when you go on your tea break, you're like, hey! One minute has passed, and you look up, and five minutes have passed. You're like, what? When you're impatient, somehow time gets warped. And these guys, for them, time got warped for them. They began to lose perspective, even of time. A second thing that I see that they lose is honor. And I found this one very interesting. Okay. If you read Exodus 32 and verse 1, this is what they say. And the second part of that verse is this. It says, As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt. This one. This fellow. Tell someone next to you, fellow. <laughs> this fellow Moses who brought us up out of him. I'm like, this guy is, Moses is their military and religious leader. But when right he's become like the waiter, boss, chief, when he, boy, boss, put up with your boss. I'm like, Moses is their leader. And at some point, they honored this guy on the Red Sea part of like, hey, Moses, good job, mine. But here they are, they're like, as for this fellow Moses, who knows what has become of him? Who knows where he has gone? And they completely lose honor for this guy who has been their leader for such a long time. This happens for me as well. I find I get impatient and I'm praying, God, heal this situation in my family, but he doesn't do it. And then I, 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 I've been singing the songs, you know, uh, in church, but our God is exalted. But then in that situation, I'm like, God, let's come, come, come. come. So the Bible says, come in as a reason to let me reason. Just come. And I find, I find myself some, sometimes asking, asking, you know, questioning God. I find myself in the place where I'm, sorry, I find interesting because I find many people get to that space. And I hear people say, I'm so pissed off with God. I'm so pissed off with Him. I'm like, you don't go to your level. I'm like, I'm so pissed off with Him. You're not coming through for me. Imagine, if you don't come through for me, me by their project this thing. People are stop going to church as a result of that. Because when I teach for tax, God hasn't, I won't. I stop going to church, I stop serving in a small group, uh, so, so, uh, sorry, serving in church, I stop attending, you know, life group or whatever it is. So I'm pissed off with God. And now I begin to question him. Honey, what are you, God? Honey, you can't see. Where is your honor? How many years do you have? You can't see my situation. And I find this guys begin to lose honor in that place. But I find myself doing that many times. Well, a third thing they lose is focus. And I find this one again very interesting because if you think about the Israelites, they had such a strong heritage of knowing God and of serving God. In fact, they refer to their God as their, the God of their fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's who they refer to. They had such a strong heritage. That was their DNA. This is the God that they follow. But look at what happens when Moses has been gone so long and they become impatient, they have not reached their promised land yet. Something changes there about their focus. They're like, this is the God that we serve. And they're like, forget about the Egyptians. The Egyptians had some cool gods. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's why they were so successful. And as they continue on the, on the journey in Exodus, they come across their Amalekites. And they wonder if they were like, whoa, Amalekites! And you guys are, they have some really cool gods. And at some point they lose focus and they make their own God. But as you read the passage, you realize they didn't even discard their God. Their God was there because Aaron makes an altar for the Lord. Capital L O R D, which is the God they served. But at that altar they served all these different gods at some point. And they began to lose focus as a result of what was going on. And it's my story also, I find. They lose focus. I won't lie to you because I'm, you know, I'm here. I was focused sometimes. And I wait on God to do something for so long. I began to look around. And when I began to look around, you look around at other people, for instance. Eh? I'm just like, you got a promotion. I'm, happy, I'm very happy for you. <laughs> you got 
to another to him. I said, I've been waiting. God bless your child. <laughs> wait, this business that you have, my mom pitched for this business. They were not That's the start and he keeps going. 
and he goes and eventually, you know, there are all these plagues, if you know the story, there are all these plagues in Egypt, and the guys leave Egypt, and then they go. I'm like, this is such a cool story, until they get to the sea stop. At this point, this is the biggest challenge these guys have ever faced. At this point, they're telling Moses, take us back. Why do you want us here to die? That's the Egyptian army coming after us. It's like, that will stop. This is like the end completely. There, there's nowhere to go from here. Most difficult challenge they've ever faced. But somehow, what Moses first starts, and we recognize the sea opens up and they go across from the other side. The army comes and they're swallowed up by the waves and everything. And they get the last thing, they're like, shh, whoo, that was close. Now let's go to our land of milk and honey, man, is waiting for us. And they two minutes more going, and then there's no water. Stop. This is the end right there. Now they're dying. This is it. No water for two million people. And they are in the wilderness. They're going to become carcasses for the wild animals, the vultures and whatnot there. Stop. The end. Was it? God bless us now and he gives them water out of a rock and they, and they keep going. Then they face an even bigger challenge. No food. No. I'm like, how many KFCs? Ten chicks? What else is that? Fries? Sandfords? <laughs> I don't know that one. Do you need to feed two million people? The story is over now. It's done. God has exhausted all his miracles. Like done. But some of our is start yet again. And they make it through this particular challenge. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen the trend. Not the watching trend. See. <laughs> funny. I don't know if you have seen the trend that is going on right now in this place. God always put them to a difficult place. They wondered what's going to happen next. And he pressed start. And they made it into a different space. You know, I read this story, it makes absolute sense to me. But I realize, whenever I come to a stop in my life, stop, I lose everything. I lose my mind. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I start throwing tantrums like children. I'm like, no, no, no. That's what I do. I suspect that some of us do as well. God says, stop. And you're waiting. And you're becoming impatient. And you're like, oh God, what kind of God? You're throwing all sorts of tantrums. I'm never going to do this. I'm never going to do that again. I find myself many times when the stop button is pressed. But I forget. But I realize something. Yeah, I think the, the Israelites realize this one thing. It's that one point of the message. But our God is a God of charity. Our God is the God of the charity. Preach to me. Tell someone next to you. Your God is the God of the charity. Your God is the God of the charity. He has a track record of finding his people in impossible situations and taking them through. What's your impossible situation today? What's something that you're waiting on today that has been delayed and you feel God is not listening, he's absent? I challenge you to take a look back at the things that God has done for you in the past. The many times in your own life and the lives of those around you that you felt, I can't do this. And God pressed start and something happened. Maybe you went to school and you didn't have things and you thought this is the end of my journey, it will never happen. Press start and something happens. Think about the time in your life when God has pressed start. You see, when these guys were at the edge of the tribulation, they forgot that God pressed start. But our God is the God of the track record, is the first thing that I want to say here. Sing a song with a tight tribute. That's a great song I love called Sing God. And he says, <laughs> if he did it before, he can do it again. Same God back then. Same God right now. The Israelites would have been wise to remember this and remember that their God had a track record with them. They forgot about it at that point. My second and final point is to look ahead. First thing is look back, see what God has done. Second point is to look ahead. You know, when I was learning how to drive, um, I made a very elementary mistake uh, all the time of learning how to drive. Because when you're learning how to drive, you drive and you, you look at the edge of the borders. That's where you keep your eyes. Look at the edge of your borders and the, the line on the road. Just like the next line, making the next line, making the next line. 
And, and as a result, this is all you've seen. It's like tunnel vision, this is all you've seen. You have no peripheral vision, you're just like, okay, just let just me there and there and there. And, and I realized then what happens with people who are learning, who learn like that, you become a very nervy driver. Who, you start kind of moving like this as you, as you go through the swing. Just hit, hit, that line, hit that line as you go on the road. Learners are especially bad on long curves. And long curves now it becomes crazy because you know, doing this. Because your eyes are just here. And I realized something very early, very hard to tell. I realized if I keep my eyes on the bonnet, I'll be a terrible driver. Right? I need to keep my eyes ahead of where I want the car to go. Because where I want the car to go somehow, the car aligns. It's like it aligns with my thinking. And it goes there. Now, it's taking a long time. I'm like, I want to get there, not here, there. And as I'm going, I'm like, I want to get there from there. And I realize as I keep my eyes ahead on the road, then it keeps me a little bit grounded. So I'm not making elementary mistakes. I want to read a passage of scripture which kind of epitomizes two points. Look back, look ahead. It's in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, and it says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance and race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, looking ahead at Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Actually, stop there. This passage is saying two things to us today. The first thing is this. Look back at God's track record. It says you are surrounded by a great cloud. You can say crowd of witnesses. And all these witnesses testify of the same thing. But this is the God of the track record. Look around you, even in the room. People have experienced it. But you're probably one of those witnesses as well you don't even realize it, that you've experienced it as well. You've experienced the God of the track record in your life. But the second thing that it says that I like is fix your gaze on Jesus. Fix your gaze on what you want in your situation, not just on your situation. Don't fix your gaze on your financial reality today. Don't fix your gaze on your emotional or religious reality today. Don't fix your eyes on what your family looks like today. Don't fix your eyes on, on your school difficult situation today. It's saying you fix your eyes on Jesus. So that you begin to align yourself towards what God's will for you is. You know, you have like God is absent today. If he's not responding, like you cannot stop for such a long time. God says this to you. You're the apple of his eye. You're his son. You're his daughter, who he loves very much. His desire for you is good. And he's working on all things for your good, even when you don't see. I mean, think about the Israelites. Moses had been gone for so long. What was he doing? God was working on the situation for their good. Even when they couldn't see it. God's work to somebody here who was even tired and impatient is God still at work.
pray this morning. I, I got up and I was preparing the message in my head and just saying there's two things I want to pray for. And I really sense God saying, God, I said, look at some people who are here today who are Christian. And you say you love them. But the reality is because a stop has been pressed in your life or a force has been pressed in your life, your heart has become hard to ask God. You're here and you look back. Maybe you sing in the worship team. Maybe you serve on a team somewhere. But you're losing your heart and heart. You've almost stopped believing God. You come and you do this religious thing and you take your life to church today. You know, I got my, you know, I got my ticket for church today. Maybe there's a part of you that's gone cold. And then it's grown dead. Maybe the people here have lost their sense of awe and wonder in God that God can. Because His first was and you've given up. You stop trusting Him. You stop believing in Him that He can still do it for you. And I believe God wants to speak to you today. He wants to speak to your heart today. And He wants to take away a hard heart from you and say, I can give you back your heart of wonder. I can give you back your heart of awe in me. But I still do amazing things. But I am still the God of the track record. Maybe some of us have a film of doubt around our hearts. And a film of dis- disbelief or mistrust. Even a, a sense of indifference towards God. Yet we still do all those things. But God wants to restore your heart today. Ezekiel 36 says, I will give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of 